This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Once again, it's time for Mises Weekends. As you can see, we're joined by Mark Thornton, who's one of our senior fellows here at the Institute. Mark, you were on, I think, RT earlier this week talking about, among other things, the great unwinding. Mm -hmm. The Fed announced this week on Wednesday that it would begin to back off the quantitative easing it's been engaged in since about 2008 and the crash, that it would start reducing, shrinking, albeit very slowly, the Fed's balance sheet. And the Wall Street Journal has been running with this for several days in a row as one of its lead stories. What will this mean for markets? Uh, technically, how will it be uh, consummated, et cetera? So I just want to talk to people a little bit about what this might mean from an Austrian perspective. Uh, first of all, for people who aren't as familiar, me mechanically talk about how this happened. How, what was QE and, and how did the Fed's balance sheet go from about $800 billion in 2008 to about $4.5 trillion today, just 10 years later? Well, it's a great transformation, Jeff. The Fed's balance sheet uh, before the crisis was a, not even a trillion dollars. It was 800 and some mm -hmm. billion dollars, and it was all short-term government borrowing that they, were, that they had on their balance sheet. Now, since then, they've transformed their balance sheet into about four and a half trillion dollars, and they've basically gotten rid of a lot of the short-term government debt. They've added a lot of long-term government debt, and they've added, of course, the, the mortgage uh, money as well. Uh, mortgage bonds. And so we've had, since the crisis, of course, they reduced interest rates to zero or close to it. And then they engaged in quantitative easing one, quantitative easing two, and operation twist. And basically with quantitative easing, the Fed is buying government bonds and they're buying mortgage-backed securities uh, and they're giving reserves out to whoever's selling them. So basically that's money that went into the banks as they relieve themselves of government debt mm -hmm. and of mortgage-backed securities. And so that's where the bulk um, of the Fed's balance sheet is right today, is in these long-term government bonds and mortgage-backed securities. Well, I'd love to see some sort of analysis of how many of those mortgage-backed securities are toxic or, or became toxic after 08. Uh, so this is sort of a roundabout way we would argue anyway, of monetizing debt. Now, it's not as direct as having the Treasury simply print money uh, to buy and extinguish Treasury debt, debt outright. This is a, a more roundabout process whereby mostly commercial banks sell Treasuries to the Fed in exchange for new bank reserves. Now, that's base money. It's not necessarily out there in the money supply and circulation. But does is this a form of, of monetizing government debt? And, and if so, is it is it purposely obscured from the American public is hard for the public to follow and understand. Well, that's the whole Fed game plan is to obscure what's really going on here. With traditional monetization, the Treasury would print up dollar bills and they would buy government bonds from the general public and from banks. Okay. Um, and then they wouldn't owe the money back. Uh, in this case, the Fed buys the government securities from banks Mm -hmm. And they give banks electronic printed money, essentially. Uh, and so it's an electronic uh, transfer. And then, of course, with the four and a half trillion dollars of assets that the Fed has, they earn interest income on all of that. And what they do is they use that interest income to pay for their expenses. Mm -hmm. And whatever's left over, they give back to the Treasury. So the Treasury, I think, is getting close to $100 billion dollars. Uh, kickback from the Fed in all of this. And uh, of course, it's it's isolating government debt and it's uh, helping to keep the interest on government debt. Most importantly, it's keeping the interest rate on government debt uh, very, very low. If they were allow mm -hmm. uh, market rates to rise and the rates on government debt rose as well, you would see the federal government's expenditure just on interest rise by hundreds of billions of dollars uh, from its uh, current uh, position, which is very, very low. Right. But it, from what I've read, it could easily go, it's about $250 uh, billion a year, it could easily go to $1 trillion, which would make it the, the single largest line item on the, on the entire U.S. budget. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't take very much. Uh, as a matter of fact, I expect uh, market rates to rise fairly significantly 
uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, the two-year government uh, note has risen noticeably over the last year or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so all indicators are that interest rates are going to have to rise and that Janet Yellen's behind the curve. Well, we know that the U.S. dollar is a little different than other currencies for a variety of reasons. One, it's the world's reserve currency for settling international transactions. Uh, OPEC countries, uh, you know, price oil in dollars. Obviously, it's backed by the enormous U.S. government and also by the U.S. military might. Mm-hmm. But conceptually, Hans Hoppe said something I think at his PS- PFS conference a couple of years ago. That it, it, this is a magic process. If governments could just spend – more than they bring in in taxes, you can even tax zero, and then create money to buy back that debt and, and hold it, um, and this could create wealth. Why doesn't every country on earth, every central bank on earth simply do this? Well, that's a very good question. I get asked that quite a bit you know, because people out there in the general public, they, they re- once they find out what's going on, uh, they want to get in on the action too. Uh, the problem with that approach, of course, is that you would end up with lots of price inflation, lots of distortions in the economy, uh, and you could it would very easily translate into a hyperinflation because people would realize the obviousness of the monetization of the debt and the impact that that was going to have on prices. And you know, as Mises said, uh, you know, there's three phases. Uh, to an inflation. One is where the general public is willing to hold all the new money in the account that's being injected in the economy. They just see mm-hmm. it as, you know, more income, more savings, more cash balances. And so at that point, the central bank gets away with it. Um, and then as price inflation becomes uh, more noticeable, people are no longer willing to add to their cash balances. Um, and so there's more spending and more price inflation. And then the third phase is when people realize that this is never going to stop, that mm. they're going to be relentless with this process. And then they decrease their cash balances. So there's more spending relative to production at that point, And prices start rising rapidly and people start de- depleting their cash balances as quickly as possible. And you end up with a hyperinflation. Like, it's like musical chairs. <laughs> it is like musical chairs. <laughs> Well, I want to talk a little bit about the media. I, I feel like the financial press is is overly credulous in the way it talks about central bankers. Yellen this week is being praised for her steady hand on the wheel, and she's going to unwind uh, the Fed's balance sheet slowly with an eye towards the market tremors. But we always imagine that that Fed governors are so omniscient and so wise, but we, we have a short memory. Uh, let me just read a quote. This is from James Bullard back in 2010. After QE got started, he said, well, the, the FOMC has often stated it's, in, its intention to return the Fed balance sheet to normal pre-crisis levels over time. That means 08, which means $800 billion. But this week, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that even if uh, this unwinding happens between now and 2020, as Yellen hopes it does, it, we'd still be somewhere between 25 and $3.5 trillion in assets. So they're not going to return to that level. Um, a year or so ago at the uh, Jackson Hole Conference, Ben Bernanke, the former chair, said, well, we may never unwind the balance sheet at all. Uh, so, so we get these different signals f- from Fed people over the years at different times depending on conditions, but nobody ever seems to bring up the inconsistencies of the past. Now, it, 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 is this something inherent uh, in our media? Is this something inherent in our economy that we just want to believe these guys and gals? Well, it certainly is the case that the chairman of the Fed and the vice chairman of the Fed have, you know, their role is to lie to the public. and to, mm. So they're lying to the media. They, they go give speeches at professional conferences and basically they're there to mislead uh, the people who are listening. Uh, you should never have listened to Alan Greenspan until he left office. You never listen to Ben Bernanke, of course, until he leaves office. And the same is true with Janet Yellen. She was saying for years that she's going to return to normal interest rates. Um, And yet 10 years after the fact, we're still at 1% on the federal funds rate, which Mm -hmm. is below the rate of price inflation. So, you know, that tells you where we are right now. And now they said this past week they're going to start unwinding the balance sheet. Uh, But think of how long it was before between when – uh, Yellen started saying she was going to normalize interest rates and when she first started raising rates. 
And now she's saying that she's going to unwind the balance sheet. But is she really? Or how long is it going to take? If if she implements the $10 billion a month um, in terms of selling off government assets, that's, I think, $6 billion in treasuries and $4 billion in uh, mortgages. Mm-hmm. That's less than two, uh, two-tenths of 1% of their balance sheet. So at that rate, they would never really um, get rid of their balance sheet or bring it back to normal. Um, and really, two-tenths of 1% is almost as if you're doing nothing at all. So even if they implement it, it's unlikely that they're going to accelerate that process very quickly. So what they say they're going to do and what they actually do, I think, are going to be two completely different things. Well, considering where we are, central banks exist. Central bank, the, the Fed controls the U.S. dollar, in effect, along with the Treasury. There's, there's several vacancies on the Board of Governors. There's going to be another one when Stanley Fisher steps down. If you could appoint whoever you want, is, is there anything that a, a John Allison or a Joe Salinger or a Mark Thornton or a, a, um, you know, even a Paul Volcker could do right now? Is there, a, is there a better way to approach this unwinding? The damage has already been done. So there's no way you're going to work around the problem without economic pain. Mm -hmm. There's no way to smoothly navigate this river. Uh, There are the rapids are in front of us, in other words. Mm. And so you're going to see a lot of uh, difficult male adjustments to all the male investments that have taken place. Now, of course, the general recommendation of Austrian economists, so if Jim Grant or Joe Salerno were appointed, they would uh, want the Fed to return uh, to normalize interest rates. They'd want to cut the Fed off from influencing interest rates and allow the market to take over. And unfortunately, when the market takes over, even if rates don't rise uh, very rapidly, um, you're going to see a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of zombie corporations going under, a lot of subprime auto loans going under, as they are right now. So it would accelerate that process, but that's the necessary proce- process of adjustment um, that you have in any business cycle. It's just this is a very long, drawn-out um, sort of a boom phase uh, of the economy where the stimulation of monetary policy has, has had effects. There's no doubt about it, but um, it's all very artificial. When it's so political, what president wants to preside over – uh, ripping off the Band-Aid. I mean, uh, when was the last time a uh, Fed chair really went against the current administration? I would say Paul Volcker is, is about the last time. And Paul Volcker may have been one of the only times where he raised rates to wring out price inflation out of the economy of inflation expectations. What I was talking earlier about Mises' three phases of inflation, uh, if we did it now, uh, you wouldn't have as much expectation problem, at least. What you'd have is all of the male investments that have been created uh, since 2008. That's where the real problem, that's where, the, where it's really going to hurt. Um, but we, we don't have as much in the way of inflationary expectations built into the system right now. Well, Mark, I love your point of we should only listen to uh, Fed chairs after they retire. I think it's a great point. You notice that uh, um, Alan Greenspan's been speaking a little bit more favorably about gold uh, in the years since he's been in. That said, Mark, thanks so much for your time. It's a very, very important topic for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.